The Chronic Pain and Fatigue Research Center is probably best known for the work we've historically done in fibromyalgia, but we literally have over the course of our existence studied at least 20 different chronic pain conditions. Conditions like interstitial cystitis, sickle cell disease, low back pain, osteoarthritis. So pretty much any condition where the primary symptom that the individual is experiencing is pain is a condition that we're interested in studying. So in the late 1990s, we were at Georgetown University and there was a donor of Georgetown University, Arthur Calcagnini, who gave a big gift because his daughter had chronic fatigue syndrome. That's also why the name Chronic Pain and Fatigue Research Center has fatigue in it, is that we actually always have been interested in studying some of the symptoms like fatigue and sleep problems that often accompany pain. But that center and that gift at Georgetown in the late 1990s sort of propelled us to become the Chronic Pain and Fatigue Research Center and then we moved the group to the University of Michigan in 2002. We feel it's incredibly important that those of us that are doing research first and foremost focus on patients with chronic pain. That's what we're here for. We're here to make the lives of people with chronic pain better and the research we do tries to better understand how we can do that. So by just putting the patients front and center, it just grounds everyone when they're doing research. It's not that we got a big grant or that you got a manuscript, it's that you made the lives of chronic pain patients better. There are several ways we collaborate with our community and patient partners. For example, a lot of our research surrounds non-pharmaceutical interventions for chronic pain conditions. To increase intervention engagement and efficacy, we work closely with our partners to ensure that these interventions are responsive to what patients want and need. The Backpack Study and the BEST Study as well as the PRISM Study are all funded by the National Institutes of Health and each in their own way help us better understand who responds best to what treatment. We look at physical therapy, we look at a couple of behavioral treatments, and we look at FDA approved medications. And the PRISM Study takes a look at cognitive behavioral therapy that's also enhanced with resilience activities to make the therapy much more engaging and entertaining and hopefully make it something that helps a person build their resilience. And for that study too, we're also looking at who responds best to this treatment and also how does the treatment work. Some of the work that we have done in an effort to try to understand the relationship between peripheral and central inflammation involves taking whole blood or immune cells from our patients and stimulating it with particular kinds of toxins. Some of these will stimulate receptors on the immune cells and then we can measure the inflammatory response that happens afterwards. And what's very interesting about this is that we find that we're able to tell the difference between patients who have localized manifestations of pain and those who have more widespread manifestations of pain. We conduct clinical trials where we use longitudinal neuroimaging um, to try to understand how treatments are causing analgesia and altering brain function and structure in, in pain patients. And we can use these results to understand uh, how treatments are, are working and also to develop new treatments. Wearables are just like what they sound. They are monitors that people can wear as they go about their daily life. And the great thing about wearables is that uh, whereas people might self-report on pain with a wearable, you can get at daily functioning in a very objective way. So you can measure things like how much a person is moving or how functional they are, or how well they're sleeping or how stressed out they are um, just by placing a wearable on their body or letting them wear a monitor. What wearables can teach us about people living with pain uh, is mostly about the function. So it's a little hard because we think of pain as being a perception, something that people self-report. It's a little hard to measure pain per se with a wearable, but what we can measure is people's functioning and how they're doing, either in response to a treatment or just day to day. One of the strengths of our program is the ability to develop new technologies. So over the years, we've collaborated with faculty in the College of Engineering and computer scientists to develop new technologies for QST. Quantitative sensory testing, or QST for short, uh, is a set of methods that uh, are used to measure sensory function. And we can look at both increases, or what you might call a gain in sensory function, phenomena such as hyperalgesia or allodynia. And we can also use it to measure 
losses in sensory function. These methods are used both clinically uh, to a degree, uh, commonly in the diagnosis of peripheral neuropathy, but also in research. And in research, we are able to use these methods to do uh, mechanistic phenotyping, to better understand the mechanisms that might be underlying pain. For many years, the Chronic Pain and Fatigue Research Center has been a leader in the development of online and digital pain self-management um, approaches and programs. Pain Guide is our current offering, and Pain Guide is composed of a number of different topics. Uh, it has education about many different types of pain. It has education about different types of interventions. The heart of Pain Guide, however, is a uh, focus on self-management or self-care. The reason why it's, it's important to offer digital intervention is, is because not everybody can uh, have a coach, not everybody can come in, into the, the pain center uh, as frequently as they might like. And so this is something that they can do at home. One of the things that's unique about the CPFRC is that we have studied a whole variety of different treatments. We've been quite interested in um, studying a broad range of therapies, which now um, often go under the umbrella of integrative therapies. Acupuncture and acupressure are now becoming more and more integrated into Western medical approaches to treatment of pain, partly because they're cheaper and they're less invasive and they're more of a gentler way of approaching pain symptoms. The Chronic Pain and Fatigue Research Center has actually been very interested in acupuncture and acupressure for many years. We were one of the first centers to be awarded a National Institute of Health grant to study uh, acupuncture in the role of fibromyalgia. And actually Dan Claw, our director, was the PI of that grant that was one of the first awarded by NIH. So the work that we're doing is multifold actually when it comes to paying cannabis and uh, psychedelics. So part of what we want to do is to understand what people are actually doing. So doing some survey studies to get a sense of how people are using say cannabis or psychedelics in the pain management context, what sorts of decisions go into that, as well as then the outcomes, and what do they attribute that to? We have so many terrific junior faculty that are very, very committed to making the lives of chronic pain patients better. Some of them have chronic pain themselves. We're getting patients more and more involved in these programs and projects. It's not about us. It's not about the faculty and their grants and their awards. It's that I'm just excited about what we are going to be able to do to make the lives of chronic pain patients better.